U.S. History, an OpenStax textbook. Read along with the full text at www.openstax.org. You can find this audiobook anywhere you listen to podcasts, including Spotify, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and more. Chapter 4. Rule Britannia, the English Empire, 1660-1763. Introduction The 18th century witnessed the birth of Great Britain after the Union of England and Scotland in 1707 and the expansion of the British Empire. By the mid-1700s, Great Britain had developed into a commercial and military powerhouse. Its economic sway ranged from India, where the British East India Company had gained control over both trade and territory, to the West African coast, where British slave traders predominated, and to the British West Indies, whose lucrative sugar plantations, especially in Barbados and Jamaica, provided windfall profits for British planters. Meanwhile, the population rose dramatically in Britain's North American colonies. In the early 1700s, the population in the colonies had reached 250,000. By 1750, however, over a million British migrants and enslaved Africans had established a near-continuous zone of settlement on the Atlantic coast from Maine to Georgia. During this period, the ties between Great Britain and the American colonies only grew stronger. Anglo-American colonists considered themselves part of the British Empire in all ways, politically, militarily, religiously as Protestants, intellectually, and racially. The portrait of the royal family exemplifies the colonial American gentry of the 18th century. Successful and well-to-do, they display fashions, hairstyles, and furnishings that all speak to their identity as proud and loyal British subjects. Four point one, Charles II and the Restoration Colonies. Learning objectives. By the end of this section, you will be able to analyze the causes and consequences of the Restoration, identify the Restoration Colonies and their role in the expansion of the Empire. When Charles II ascended the throne in 1660, English subjects on both sides of the Atlantic celebrated the restoration of the English monarchy after a decade of living without a king as a result of the English Civil Wars. Charles II lost little time in strengthening England's global power. From the 1660s to the 1680s, Charles II added more possessions to England's North American holdings by establishing the restoration colonies of New York and New Jersey, taking these areas from the Dutch, as well as Pennsylvania and the Carolinas. In order to reap the greatest economic benefit from England's overseas possessions, Charles II enacted the Mercantilist Navigation Acts, although many colonial merchants ignored them because enforcement remained lax. Charles II The chronicle of Charles II begins with his father, Charles I. Charles I ascended the English throne in 1625 and soon married a French Catholic princess, Henrietta Maria, who was not well liked by English Protestants because she openly practiced Catholicism during her husband's reign. The most outspoken Protestants, the Puritans, had a strong voice in Parliament in the 1620s, and they strongly opposed the king's marriage and his ties to Catholicism. When Parliament tried to contest his edicts, including the king's efforts to impose taxes without Parliament's consent, Charles I suspended Parliament in 1629 and ruled without one for the next 11 years. The ensuing struggle between the king and parliament led to the outbreak of war. The English Civil War lasted from 1642 to 1649 and pitted the king and his royalist supporters against Oliver Cromwell and his parliamentary forces. After years of fighting, the parliamentary forces gained the upper hand, and in 1649, they charged Charles I with treason, and beheaded him. The monarchy was dissolved, and England became a republic 
A State Without a King Oliver Cromwell headed the New English Commonwealth, and the period known as the English Interregnum, or the time between kings, began. Though Cromwell enjoyed widespread popularity at first, over time he appeared to many in England to be taking on the powers of a military dictator. Dissatisfaction with Cromwell grew. When he died in 1658, and control passed to his son Richard, who lacked the political skills of his father, a majority of the English people feared an alternate hereditary monarchy in the making. They had had enough, and asked Charles II to be king. In 1660, they welcomed the son of the executed king Charles I back to the throne to resume the English monarchy and bring the interregnum to an end. The return of Charles II is known as the Restoration. Charles II was committed to expanding England's overseas possessions. His policies in the 1660s through the 1680s established and supported the Restoration colonies, the Carolinas, New Jersey, New York, and Pennsylvania. All the Restoration colonies started as proprietary colonies. That is, the king gave each colony to a trusted individual, family, or group. The Carolinas Charles II hoped to establish English control of the area between Virginia and Spanish Florida. To that end, he issued a royal charter in 1663 to eight trusted and loyal supporters, each of whom was to be a feudal-style proprietor of a region of the province of Carolina. These proprietors did not relocate to the colonies, however. Instead, English plantation owners from the tiny Caribbean island of Barbados, already a well-established English sugar colony fueled by slave labor, migrated to the southern part of Carolina to settle there. In 1670, they established Charlestown, later Charleston, named in honor of Charles II, at the junction of the Ashley and Cooper Rivers. As the settlement around Charlestown grew, it began to produce livestock for export to the West Indies. In the northern part of Carolina, settlers used sap from pine trees to create tar and pitch used to waterproof wooden ships. Political disagreements between settlers in the northern and southern parts of Carolina escalated in the 1710s through the 1720s and led to the creation, in 1729, of two colonies, North and South Carolina. The southern part of Carolina had been producing rice and indigo, a plant that yields a dark blue dye used by English royalty since the 1700s, and South Carolina continued to depend on these main crops. North Carolina continued to produce items for ships, especially turpentine and tar, and its population increased as Virginians moved there to expand their tobacco holdings. Tobacco was the primary export of both Virginia and North Carolina, which also traded in deerskins and captured people from Africa. Slavery developed quickly in the Carolinas, largely because so many of the early migrants came from Barbados, where slavery was well established. By the end of the 1600s, a very wealthy class of rice planters who relied on enslaved people for labor had attained dominance in the southern part of the Carolinas, especially around Charlestown. By 1715, South Carolina had a black majority because of the number of enslaved people in the colony. The legal basis for slavery was established in the early 1700s as the Carolinas began to pass slave laws based on the Barbados slave codes of the late 1600s. These laws reduced Africans to the status of property to be bought and sold as other commodities. As in other areas of English settlement, native peoples in the Carolinas suffered tremendously from the introduction of European diseases. Despite the effects of disease, Native Americans in the area endured and, following the pattern elsewhere in the colonies, grew dependent on European goods. Local Yamasee and Creek tribes built up a trade deficit with the English, trading deerskins, and captive people for European guns. English settlers exacerbated tensions with local Native American tribes, especially the Yamasee, 
by expanding their rice and tobacco fields into Native American lands. Worse still, English traders took Native women captive as payment for debts. The outrages committed by traders, combined with the seemingly unstoppable expansion of English settlement onto Native land, led to the outbreak of the Yamasee War, 1715 to 1718, an effort by a coalition of local tribes to drive away the European invaders. This native effort to force the newcomers back across the Atlantic nearly succeeded in annihilating the Carolina colonies. Only when the Cherokee allied themselves with the English did the coalition's goal of eliminating the English from the region falter. The Yamasee War demonstrates the key role native peoples played in shaping the outcome of colonial struggles and, perhaps most important, the disunity that existed between different native groups. New York and New Jersey Charles II also set his sights on the Dutch colony of New Netherland. The English takeover of New Netherland originated in the imperial rivalry between the Dutch and the English. During the Anglo-Dutch Wars of the 1650s and 1660s, the two powers attempted to gain commercial advantages in the Atlantic world. During the Second Anglo-Dutch War, 1664 to 1667, English forces gained control of the Dutch fur trading colony of New Netherland, and in 1664, Charles II gave this colony, including present-day New Jersey, to his brother James, Duke of York, later James II. The colony and city were renamed New York in his honor. The Dutch in New York chafed under English rule. In 1673, during the Third Anglo-Dutch War, 1672 to 1674, the Dutch recaptured the colony. However, at the end of the conflict, the English had regained control. The Duke of York had no desire to govern locally or listen to the wishes of local colonists. It wasn't until 1683, therefore, almost 20 years after the English took control of the colony, that colonists were able to convene a local representative legislature. The Assembly's 1683 Charter of Liberties and Privileges set out the traditional rights of Englishmen, like the right to trial by jury and the right to representative government. The English continued the Dutch patroonship system, granting large estates to a favored few families. The largest of these estates, at 160,000 acres, was given to Robert Livingston in 1686. The Livingstons and the other manorial families who controlled the Hudson River Valley formed a formidable political and economic force. 18th century New York City, meanwhile, contained a variety of people and religions, as well as Dutch and English people. It held French Protestants, Huguenots, Jews, Puritans, Quakers, Anglicans, and a large population of enslaved people. As they did in other zones of colonization, Native peoples played a key role in shaping the history of colonial New York. After decades of war in the 1600s, the powerful five nations of the Iroquois, composed of the Mohawk, Oneida, Onondaga, Cayuga, and Seneca, successfully pursued a policy of neutrality with both the English and, to the north, the French in Canada during the first half of the 1700s. This native policy meant that the Iroquois continued to live in their own villages under their own government while enjoying the benefits of trade with both the French and the English. Pennsylvania The Restoration Colonies also included Pennsylvania, which became the geographic center of British colonial America. Pennsylvania, which means Penn's Woods in Latin, was created in 1681, when Charles II bestowed the largest proprietary colony in the Americas on William Penn to settle the large debt he owed the Penn family. William Penn's father, Admiral William Penn, had served the English crown by helping take Jamaica from the Spanish in 1655. The king personally owed the admiral money as well. Like early settlers of the New England colonies, Pennsylvania's first colonists migrated mostly for religious reasons. William Penn himself was a Quaker, 
a member of a new Protestant denomination called the Society of Friends. George Fox had founded the Society of Friends in England in the late 1640s, having grown dissatisfied with Puritanism and the idea of predestination. Rather, Fox and his followers stressed that everyone had an inner light inside him or her, a spark of divinity. They gained the name Quakers because they were said to quake when the inner light moved them. Quakers rejected the idea of worldly rank, believing instead in a new and radical form of social equality. Their speech reflected this belief in that they addressed all others as equals using thee and thou, rather than terms like your lordship or my lady that were customary for privileged individuals of the hereditary elite. The English crown persecuted Quakers in England, and some colonial governments were equally harsh. Massachusetts even executed several early Quakers who had gone to proselytize there. To avoid such persecution, Quakers and their families created a community on the Sugar Island of Barbados or moved to the religiously tolerant colony of Rhode Island. Soon after its founding, however, Pennsylvania became the destination of choice. Quakers flocked to Pennsylvania as well as New Jersey, where they could preach and practice their religion in peace. Unlike much of New England, whose official religion was Puritanism, Pennsylvania did not establish an official church. Indeed, with the notable exception of Rhode Island, the Pennsylvania colony allowed a degree of religious tolerance found nowhere else in English America. To help encourage immigration to his colony, Penn promised 50 acres of land to people who agreed to come to Pennsylvania and completed their term of service. Not surprisingly, those seeking a better life came in large numbers, so much so that Pennsylvania relied on indentured servants more than any other colony. One of the primary tenets of Quakerism is pacifism, which led William Penn to establish friendly relationships with local native peoples. He formed a covenant of friendship with the Leni Lenape, Delaware tribe, buying their land for a fair price instead of taking it by force. In 1701, he also signed a treaty with the Susquehannocks to avoid war. Unlike other colonies, Pennsylvania did not experience war on the frontier with native peoples during its early history. As an important port city, Philadelphia grew rapidly. Quaker merchants there established contacts throughout the Atlantic world and participated in the thriving African slave trade. Some Quakers, who were deeply troubled by the contradiction between their belief in the inner light and the practice of slavery, rejected the practice and engaged in efforts to abolish it altogether. Philadelphia also acted as a magnet for immigrants who came not only from England, but from all over Europe by the hundreds of thousands. The city, and indeed all of Pennsylvania, appeared to be the best country for poor men and women, many of whom arrived as servants and dreamed of owning land. A very few, like the fortunate Benjamin Franklin, a runaway from Puritan Boston, did extraordinarily well. Other immigrant groups in the colony, most notably Germans and Scots-Irish, families from Scotland and England who had first lived in Ireland before moving to British America, greatly improved their lot in Pennsylvania. Of course, Africans brought into the colony to labor for white enslavers fared far worse. Americana. John Wilson offers reward for escaped prisoners. The American Weekly Mercury, published by William Bradford, was Philadelphia's first newspaper. This advertisement from John Wilson, Goler, jailer, offers a reward for anyone capturing several men who escaped from the jail. Broke out of the common goal of Philadelphia, the 15th of this instant February, 1721, the following persons. John Palmer, also Plumley, alias Payne, servant to Joseph Jones, run away and was lately taken up at New York. He is fully described in the American Mercury, November 23, 1721. He has a cinnamon-colored coat on, a middle-sized fresh-colored man. His master will give a pistole reward to any who shall secure him, besides what is here offered. Daniel Audipe, a Dutchman aged about 24 years, servant to Dr. Johnston in Amboy. He is a thin, spare man, gray drugget waistcoat and breeches, and a light-colored coat on, 
Ebenezer Mallory, a New England, aged about 24 years, is a middle-sized thin man, having on a snuff-colored coat, an ordinary ticking waistcoat and breeches. He has dark brown straight hair. Matthew Delaney, an Irish man, down-looked swarthy complexion, and has on an olive-colored cloth coat and waistcoat with cloth buttons. John Fleming, an Irish lad, aged about 18, belonging to Mr. Miranda, merchant in the city. He has no coat, a gray drugget waistcoat, and a narrow-brimmed hat on. John Corbett, a Shropshire man, a runaway servant from Alexander Faulkner of Maryland, broke out on the twelfth instant. He has got a double-breasted sailor's jacket on, lined with red bays, pretends to be a sailor, and once taught school at Joseph's Collings's in the Jerseys. Whoever takes up and secures all or any one of these felons shall have a pistole reward for each of them and reasonable charges, paid them by John Wilson, Goler. Advertisement from the American Weekly Mercury, 1722. What do the descriptions of the men tell you about life in colonial Philadelphia? The Navigation Acts Creating wealth for the empire remained a primary goal, and in the second half of the 17th century, especially during the Restoration, England attempted to gain better control of trade with the American colonies. The mercantilist policies by which it tried to achieve this control are known as the Navigation Acts. The 1651 Navigation Ordinance, a product of Cromwell's England, required that only English ships carry goods between England and the colonies, and that the captain and three-fourths of the crew had to be English. The ordinance further listed enumerated articles that could be transported only to England or to English colonies, including the most lucrative commodities like sugar and tobacco, as well as indigo, rice, molasses, and naval stores such as turpentine. All were valuable goods not produced in England and in demand by the British Navy. After ascending the throne, Charles II approved the 1660 Navigation Act, which restated the 1651 Act to ensure a monopoly on imports from the colonies. Other Navigation Acts included the 1663 Staple Act and the 1673 Plantation Duties Act. The Staple Act barred colonists from importing goods that had not been made in England, creating a profitable monopoly for English exporters and manufacturers. The Plantation Duties Act taxed enumerated articles exported from one colony to another, a measure aimed principally at New Englanders, who transported great quantities of molasses from the West Indies, including smuggled molasses from French-held islands to make into rum. In 1675, Charles II organized the Lords of Trade and Plantation, commonly known as the Lords of Trade, an administrative body intended to create stronger ties between the colonial governments and the crown. However, the 1696 Navigation Act created the Board of Trade, replacing the Lords of Trade. This act, meant to strengthen enforcement of customs laws, also established vice admiralty courts where the Crown could prosecute customs violators without a jury. Under this act, customs officials were empowered with warrants known as writs of assistance to board and search vessels suspected of containing smuggled goods. Despite the Navigation Acts, however, Great Britain exercised lax control over the English colonies during most of the 18th century because of the policies of Prime Minister Robert Walpole. During his long term, 1721 to 1742, Walpole governed according to his belief that commerce flourished best when it was not encumbered with restrictions. Historians have described this lack of strict enforcement of the Navigation Acts as salutary neglect. In addition, nothing prevented colonists from building their own fleet of ships to engage in trade. New England especially benefited from both salutary neglect and a vibrant maritime culture made possible by the scores of trading vessels built in the northern colonies. The case of the 1733 Molasses Act illustrates the weaknesses of British mercantilist policy. The 1733 Act placed a sixpence per gallon duty on raw sugar, rum, and molasses from Britain's competitors, the French and the Dutch, in order to give an advantage to British West Indian producers. In 
Because the British did not enforce the 1733 law, however, New England mariners routinely smuggled these items from the French and Dutch West Indies more cheaply than they could buy them on English islands. Four point two, the Glorious Revolution and the English Empire. Learning objectives. By the end of this section, you will be able to identify the causes of the Glorious Revolution. Explain the outcomes of the Glorious Revolution. During the brief rule of King James the Second, many in England feared the imposition of a Catholic absolute monarchy by the man who modeled his rule on that of his French Catholic cousin Louis the Fourteenth. Opposition to James II, spearheaded by the English Whig Party, overthrew the king in the Glorious Revolution of 1688 to 1689. This paved the way for the Protestant reign of William of Orange and his wife Mary, James's Protestant daughter. James II and the Glorious Revolution King James II, the second son of Charles I, ascended the English throne in 1685 on the death of his brother, Charles II. James then worked to model his rule on the reign of the French Catholic King Louis XIV, his cousin. This meant centralizing English political strength around the throne, giving the monarchy absolute power. Also, like Louis XIV, James II practiced a strict and intolerant form of Roman Catholicism, after he converted from Protestantism in the late 1660s. He had a Catholic wife, and when they had a son, the potential for a Catholic heir to the English throne became a threat to English Protestants. James also worked to modernize the English army and navy. The fact that the king kept a standing army in times of peace greatly alarmed the English, who believed that such a force would be used to crush their liberty. As James's strength grew, his opponents feared their king would turn England into a Catholic monarchy with absolute power over her people. In 1686, James II applied his concept of a centralized state to the colonies by creating an enormous colony called the Dominion of New England. The Dominion included all the New England colonies, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Plymouth, Connecticut, New Haven, and Rhode Island and in 1688 was enlarged by the addition of New York and New Jersey. James placed in charge Sir Edmund Andros, a former colonial governor of New York. Loyal to James II and his family, Andros had little sympathy for New Englanders. His regime caused great uneasiness among New England Puritans when it called into question the many land titles that did not acknowledge the king and imposed fees for their reconfirmation. Andros also committed himself to enforcing the Navigation Acts, a move that threatened to disrupt the region's trade, which was based largely on smuggling. In England, opponents of James II's efforts to create a centralized Catholic state were known as Whigs. The Whigs worked to depose James, and in late 1688 they succeeded, an event they celebrated as the Glorious Revolution, while James fled to the court of Louis Louis XIV in France, William III, William of Orange, and his wife Mary II ascended the throne in 1689. The Glorious Revolution spilled over into the colonies. In 1689, Bostonians overthrew the government of the Dominion of New England and jailed Sir Edmund Andros as well as other leaders of the regime. The removal of Andros from power illustrates New England's animosity toward the English overlord who had, during his tenure, established Church of England worship in Puritan Boston and vigorously enforced the Navigation Acts to the chagrin of those in port towns. In New York, the same year that Andros fell from power, Jacob Leisler led a group of Protestant New Yorkers against the Dominion government. Acting on his own authority, Leisler assumed the role of King William's governor and organized intercolonial military action independent of British authority. Leisler's actions usurped the Crown's prerogative, and as a result, he was tried for treason 
and executed. In 1691, England restored control over the province of New York. The Glorious Revolution provided a shared experience for those who lived through the tumult of 1688 and 1689. Subsequent generations kept the memory of the Glorious Revolution alive as a heroic defense of English liberty against a would-be tyrant. English Liberty The Glorious Revolution led to the establishment of an English nation that limited the power of the king and provided protections for English subjects. In October 1689, the same year that William and Mary took the throne, the 1689 Bill of Rights established a constitutional monarchy. It stipulated Parliament's independence from the monarchy and protected certain of Parliament's rights, such as the right to freedom of speech, the right to regular elections, and the right to petition the king. The 1689 Bill of Rights also guaranteed certain rights to all English subjects, including trial by jury and habeas corpus, the requirement that authorities bring an imprisoned person before a court to demonstrate the cause of the imprisonment. John Locke, 1632 to 1704, a doctor and educator who had lived in exile in Holland during the reign of James II, and returned to England after the Glorious Revolution, published his Two Treatises of Government in 1690. In it, he argued that government was a form of contract between the leaders and the people, and that representative government existed to protect life, liberty, and property. Locke rejected the divine right of kings, and instead advocated for the central role of parliament with a limited monarchy. Locke's political philosophy had an enormous impact on future generations of colonists and established the paramount importance of representation in government. The Glorious Revolution also led to the English Toleration Act of 1689, a law passed by Parliament that allowed for greater religious diversity in the empire. This act granted religious tolerance to nonconformist Trinitarian Protestants those who believed in the Holy Trinity of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, such as Baptists, those who advocated adult baptism, and Congregationalists, those who followed the Puritans' lead in creating independent churches. While the Church of England remained the official state religious establishment, the Toleration Act gave much greater religious freedom to nonconformists. However, this tolerance did not extend to Catholics, who were routinely excluded from political power. The 1689 Toleration Act extended to the British colonies, where several colonies, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, Delaware, and New Jersey, refused to allow the creation of an established colonial church, a major step toward greater religious diversity. Four point three, an empire of slavery and the consumer revolution. Learning objectives. By the end of this section, you will be able to analyze the role slavery played in the history and economy of the British Empire, explain the effects of the 1739 Stono Rebellion and the 1741 New York Conspiracy Trials, describe the consumer revolution and its effect on the life of the colonial gentry and other settlers. Slavery formed a cornerstone of the British Empire in the 18th century. Every colony had enslaved people, from the southern rice plantations in Charlestown, South Carolina, to the northern wharves of Boston. Slavery was more than a labor system. It also influenced every aspect of colonial thought and culture. The uneven relationship it engendered gave white colonists an exaggerated sense of their own status. English liberty gained greater meaning and coherence for white people when they contrasted their status to that of the unfree class of enslaved black people in British America. African slavery provided white colonists with a shared racial bond and identity. Slavery and the Stono Rebellion The transport of captured Africans to the American colonies accelerated in the second half of the 17th century. In 1660, Charles II created the Royal African Company 
to trade in African goods and enslaved people. His brother, James II, led the company before ascending the throne. Under both these kings, the Royal African Company had a monopoly on the slave trade to the English colonies. Between 1672 and 1713, the company bought 125,000 captives on the African coast, losing 20% of them to death on the Middle Passage, the journey from the African coast to the Americas. The Royal African Company's monopoly ended in 1689 as a result of the Glorious Revolution. After that date, many more English merchants engaged in the slave trade, greatly increasing the number of captives being transported. Africans who survived the brutal Middle Passage usually arrived in the West Indies, often in Barbados. From there, they were transported to the mainland English colonies on company ships. While merchants in London, Bristol, and Liverpool lined their pockets, Africans trafficked by the company endured a nightmare of misery, privation, and dislocation. Enslaved Africans strove to adapt to their new lives by forming new communities among themselves, often adhering to traditional African customs and healing techniques. Indeed, the development of families and communities formed the most important response to the trauma of being enslaved. Others dealt with the trauma of their situation by actively resisting their condition, whether by defying their captors or running away. Escaped enslaved people formed what were called maroon communities, groups that successfully resisted recapture and formed their own autonomous groups. The most prominent of these communities lived in the interior of Jamaica, controlling the area and keeping the British away. Enslaved people everywhere resisted their exploitation and attempted to gain freedom. They fully understood that rebellions would bring about massive retaliation from white people and therefore had little chance of success. Even so, rebellions occurred frequently. One notable uprising that became known as the Stono Rebellion took place in South Carolina in September 1739. A literate Angolan named Jemmy led a large group of captive Africans in an armed insurrection against white colonists. The militia suppressed the rebellion after a battle in which both enslaved people and militiamen were killed, and the remaining rebels were executed or sold to enslavers in the West Indies. Jemmy is believed to have been taken from the Kingdom of Congo, an area where the Portuguese had introduced Catholicism. Other enslaved people in South Carolina may have had a similar background, Africa-born and familiar with white people. If so, this common background may have made it easier for Jemmy to communicate with the other rebels, enabling them to work together to resist their enslavement, even though enslavers labored to keep their captives from forging such communities. In the wake of the Stono Rebellion, South Carolina passed a new slave code in 1740 called An Act for the Better Ordering and Governing of Negroes and Other Slaves in the Province, also known as the Negro Act of 1740. This law imposed new limits on enslaved people's behavior, prohibiting them from assembling, growing their own food, learning to write, and traveling freely. The New York Conspiracy Trials of 1741 18th century New York City contained many different ethnic groups, and conflicts among them created strain. In addition, one in five New Yorkers was an enslaved person, and tensions ran high between the enslaved and the free population, especially in the aftermath of the Stono Rebellion. These tensions burst forth in 1741. That year, 13 fires broke out in the city, one of which reduced the colony's Fort George to ashes. Ever fearful of an uprising among enslaved New Yorkers, the city's white residents spread rumors that the fires were part of a massive revolt in which enslaved people would murder white people, burn the city, and take over the colony. The Stono Rebellion was only a few years in the past, and throughout British America, fears of similar incidents were still fresh.
searching for solutions, and convinced their captives were the principal danger, nervous British authorities interrogated almost 200 enslaved people and accused them of conspiracy. Rumors that Roman Catholics had joined the suspected conspiracy and planned to murder Protestant inhabitants of the city only added to the general hysteria. Very quickly, 200 people were arrested, including a large number of the city's enslaved population. After a quick series of trials at City Hall, known as the New York Conspiracy Trials of 1741, the government executed 17 New Yorkers. Thirteen black men were publicly burned at the stake, while the others, including four white men, were hanged. Seventy people were sold to the West Indies. Little evidence exists to prove that an elaborate conspiracy, like the one white New Yorkers imagined, actually existed. The events of 1741 in New York City illustrate the racial divide in British America, where panic among white people spurred great violence against and repression of the feared enslaved population. In the end, the conspiracy trials furthered white dominance and power over enslaved New Yorkers. Colonial Gentry and the Consumer Revolution British Americans' reliance on indentured servitude and slavery to meet the demand for colonial labor helped give rise to a wealthy colonial class, the gentry, in the Chesapeake tobacco colonies and elsewhere. To be genteel, that is, a member of the gentry, meant to be refined, free of all rudeness. The British American gentry modeled themselves on the English aristocracy, who embodied the ideal of refinement and gentility. They built elaborate mansions to advertise their status and power. William Byrd, the second of Westover, Virginia, exemplifies the colonial gentry, a wealthy planter and slaveholder. He is known for founding Richmond and for his diaries documenting the life of a gentleman planter. One of the ways in which the gentry set themselves apart from others was through their purchase, consumption, and display of goods. An increased supply of consumer goods from England that became available in the 18th century led to a phenomenon called the Consumer Revolution. These products linked the colonies to Great Britain in real and tangible ways. Indeed, along with the colonial gentry, ordinary settlers in the colonies also participated in the frenzy of consumer spending on goods from Great Britain. Tea, for example, came to be regarded as the drink of the empire, with or without fashionable tea sets. The consumer revolution also made printed materials more widely available. Before 1680, for instance, no newspapers had been printed in colonial America. In the 18th century, however, a flood of journals, books, pamphlets, and other publications became available to readers on both sides of the Atlantic. This shared trove of printed matter linked members of the empire by creating a community of shared tastes and ideas. Cato's Letters by Englishmen John Trenchard and Thomas Gordon was one popular series of 144 pamphlets. These Whig circulars were published between 1720 and 1723 and emphasized the glory of England, especially its commitment to liberty. However, the pamphlets cautioned readers to be ever vigilant and on the lookout for attacks upon that liberty. Indeed, Cato's letters suggested that there were constant efforts to undermine and destroy it. Another very popular publication was the English gentleman's magazine The Spectator, published between 1711 and 1714. In each issue, Mr. Spectator observed and commented on the world around him. What made The Spectator so wildly popular was its style. The essays were meant to persuade and to cultivate among readers a refined set of behaviors, rejecting deceit and intolerance, and focusing instead on the polishing of genteel taste and manners. Novels, a new type of literature, made their first appearance in the 18th century and proved very popular in the British Atlantic. Daniel Defoe's Robinson Crusoe and Samuel Richardson's Pamela, or Virtue Rewarded, found large and receptive audiences.
reading also allowed female readers the opportunity to interpret what they read without depending on a male authority to tell them what to think. Few women beyond the colonial gentry, however, had access to novels. My Story, William Byrd's Secret Diary The Diary of William Byrd, a Virginia planter, provides a unique way to better understand colonial life on a plantation. What does it show about daily life for a gentleman planter and enslaver? What does it show about slavery? August 27, 1709 I rose at five o'clock and read two chapters in Hebrew and some Greek in Josephus. I said my prayers and ate milk for breakfast. I danced my dance. I had liked to have whipped my maid Annika for her laziness, but I forgave her. I read a little geometry. I denied my man GRL to go to a horse race because there was nothing but swearing and drinking there. I ate roast mutton for dinner. In the afternoon, I played at PK with my own wife and made her out of humor by cheating her. I read some Greek in Homer. Then I walked about the plantation. I lent John H. seven English pounds in his distress. I said my prayers and had good health, good thoughts, and good humor. Thanks be to God Almighty. September 6, 1709. About one o'clock this morning, my wife was happily delivered of a son. Thanks be to God Almighty. I was awake in a blink and rose, and my cousin Harrison met me on the stairs and told me it was a boy. We drank some French wine and went to bed again and rose at seven o'clock. I read a chapter in Hebrew and then drank chocolate with the women for breakfast. I returned God humble thanks for so great a blessing and recommended my young son to his divine protection. September 15, 1710. I rose at five o'clock and read two chapters in Hebrew and some Greek in Thucydides. I said my prayers and ate milk and pears for breakfast. About seven o'clock the Negro boy, or Betty, that ran away was brought home. My wife against my will caused little Jenny to be burned with a hot iron, for which I quarreled with her. Four point four. Great Awakening and Enlightenment Learning Objectives By the end of this section, you will be able to Explain the significance of the Great Awakening Describe the genesis, central ideas, and effects of the Enlightenment in British North America Two major cultural movements further strengthened Anglo-American colonists' connection to Great Britain The Great Awakening and the Enlightenment Both movements began in Europe but they advocated very different ideas. The Great Awakening promoted a fervent emotional religiosity, while the Enlightenment encouraged the pursuit of reason in all things. On both sides of the Atlantic, British subjects grappled with these new ideas. The First Great Awakening During the 18th century, the British Atlantic experienced an outburst of Protestant revivalism, known as the First Great Awakening. A Second Great Awakening would take place in the 1800s. During the First Great Awakening, evangelists came from the ranks of several Protestant denominations. Congregationalists, Anglicans, members of the Church of England, and Presbyterians. They rejected what appeared to be sterile, formal modes of worship in favor of a vigorous emotional religiosity. Whereas Martin Luther and John Calvin had preached a doctrine of predestination and close reading of Scripture, new evangelical ministers spread a message of personal and experiential faith that rose above mere book learning. Individuals could bring about their own salvation by accepting Christ, an especially welcome message for those who had felt excluded by traditional Protestantism, women, the young, and people at the lower end of the social spectrum. The Great Awakening caused a split between those who followed the evangelical message, the New Lights, and those who rejected it, the Old Lights. The elite ministers in British America were firmly Old Lights, and they censured the new revivalism as chaos. Indeed, the revivals did sometimes lead to excess. In one notorious incident in 1743, an influential New Light minister named James Davenport urged his listeners to burn books. The next day, he told them to burn their clothes as a sign of their casting off the sinful trappings of the world. He then took off his own pants and threw them into the fire, 
but a woman saved them and tossed them back to Davenport, telling him he had gone too far. Another outburst of Protestant revivalism began in New Jersey, led by a minister of the Dutch Reformed Church named Theodorus Frelinghuysen. Frelinghuysen's example inspired other ministers, including Gilbert Tennant, a Presbyterian. Tennant helped to spark a Presbyterian revival in the Middle Colonies, Pennsylvania, New York, and New Jersey, in part by founding a seminary to train other evangelical clergymen. New Lights also founded colleges in Rhode Island and New Hampshire that would later become Brown University and Dartmouth College. In Northampton, Massachusetts, Jonathan Edwards led still another explosion of evangelical fervor. Edwards had grown frustrated with lack of religious emotion among practicing Christians within his community. He wanted to enliven religious practice. An important component of his approach involved using vivid depictions of the terrors of hell. Edwards' best-known sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, perfectly exemplifies this terrifying approach. One passage reads, The wrath of God burns against them, sinners. Their damnation don't slumber. The pit is prepared. The fire is made ready. The furnace is now hot, ready to receive them. The flames do now rage and glow. The glittering sword is wet and held over them, and the pit hath opened her mouth under them. Edwards's revival spread along the Connecticut River Valley, and news of the event spread rapidly through the frequent reprinting of his famous sermon. The foremost evangelical of the Great Awakening was an Anglican minister named George Whitefield. Like many evangelical ministers, Whitefield was itinerant, traveling the countryside instead of having his own church and congregation. Between 1739 and 1740, he electrified colonial listeners with his brilliant oratory. The Great Awakening saw the rise of several Protestant denominations, including Methodists, Presbyterians, and Baptists, who emphasized adult baptism of converted Christians rather than infant baptism. These new churches gained converts and competed with older Protestant groups like Anglicans, members of the Church of England, Congregationalists, the heirs of Puritanism in America, and Quakers. The influence of these older Protestant groups, such as the New England Congregationalists, declined because of the Great Awakening. Nonetheless, the Great Awakening touched the lives of thousands on both sides of the Atlantic and provided a shared experience in the 18th century British Empire. Americana, two opposing views of George Whitefield. Not everyone embraced George Whitefield and other new lights. Many established old lights decried the way the new evangelical religions appealed to people's passions, rather than to traditional religious values. The two illustrations below present two very different visions of George Whitefield. Compare the two images displayed in the textbook. On the left is an illustration for Whitefield's memoirs, while on the right is a cartoon satirizing the circus-like atmosphere that his preaching seemed to attract. Dr. Squintum was a nickname for Whitefield who was cross-eyed. How do these two artists portray the same man? What emotions are the illustration for his memoirs intended to evoke? What details can you find in the cartoon that indicate the artist's distaste for the preacher? The Enlightenment? The Enlightenment, or the Age of Reason, was an intellectual and cultural movement in the 18th century that emphasized reason over superstition and science over blind faith. Using the power of the press, Enlightenment thinkers like John Locke, Isaac Newton, and Voltaire questioned accepted knowledge and spread new ideas about openness, investigation, and religious tolerance throughout Europe and the Americas. Many consider the Enlightenment a major turning point in Western civilization, an age of light replacing an age of darkness. Several ideas dominated Enlightenment thought, including rationalism, empiricism, progressivism, and cosmopolitanism. Rationalism is the idea that humans are capable of using their faculty of reason to gain knowledge. This was a sharp turn away from the prevailing idea that people needed to rely on scripture or church authorities for knowledge. Empiricism promotes the idea 
that knowledge comes from experience and observation of the world. Progressivism is the belief that through their powers of reason and observation, humans could make unlimited, linear progress over time. This belief was especially important as a response to the carnage and upheaval of the English civil wars in the 17th century. Finally, cosmopolitanism reflected Enlightenment thinkers' view of themselves as citizens of the world and actively engaged in it, as opposed to being provincial and close-minded. In all, Enlightenment thinkers endeavored to be ruled by reason, not prejudice. The Freemasons were a fraternal society that advocated Enlightenment principles of inquiry and tolerance. Freemasonry originated in London coffee houses in the early 18th century, and Masonic lodges, local units, soon spread throughout Europe and the British colonies. One prominent Freemason, Benjamin Franklin, stands as the embodiment of the Enlightenment in British America. Born in Boston in 1706, to a large Puritan family, Franklin loved to read, although he found little beyond religious publications in his father's house. In 1718, he was apprenticed to his brother to work in a print shop, where he learned how to be a good writer by copying the style he found in The Spectator, which his brother printed. At the age of 17, the independent-minded Franklin ran away, eventually ending up in Quaker Philadelphia. There, he began publishing the Pennsylvania Gazette in the late 1720s, and in 1732, he started his annual publication, Poor Richard, an Almanac, in which he gave readers much practical advice, such as, early to bed, early to rise, makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. Franklin subscribed to deism, an Enlightenment-era belief in a God who created, but has no continuing involvement in the world, and the events within it. Deists also advance the belief that personal morality, an individual's moral compass, leading to good works and actions, is more important than strict church doctrines. Franklin's deism guided his many philanthropic projects. In 1731, he established a reading library that became the Library Company of Philadelphia. In 1743, he founded the American Philosophical Society to encourage the spirit of inquiry. In 1749, he provided the foundation for the University of Pennsylvania, and in 1751, he helped found Pennsylvania Hospital. His career as a printer made Franklin wealthy and well-respected. When he retired in 1748, he devoted himself to politics and scientific experiments. His most famous work, on electricity, exemplified Enlightenment principles. Franklin observed that lightning strikes tended to hit metal objects and reasoned that he could therefore direct lightning through the placement of metal objects during an electrical storm. He used this knowledge to advocate the use of lightning rods, metal poles connected to wires directing lightning's electrical charge into the ground and saving wooden homes in cities like Philadelphia from catastrophic fires. He published his findings in 1751 in Experiments and Observations on Electricity. Franklin also wrote of his rags to riches tale, his memoir, in the 1770s and 1780s. This story laid the foundation for the American dream of upward social mobility. The Founding of Georgia The reach of Enlightenment thought was both broad and deep. In the 1730s, it even prompted the founding of a new colony. Having witnessed the terrible conditions of debtors' prison, as well as the results of releasing penniless debtors onto the streets of London, James Oglethorpe, a member of Parliament and advocate of social reform, petitioned King George II for a charter to start a new colony. George II, understanding the strategic advantage of a British colony standing as a buffer between South Carolina and Spanish Florida, granted the charter to Oglethorpe and 20 like-minded proprietors in 1732. Oglethorpe led the settlement of the colony, which was called Georgia, in honor of the king. In 1733, he and 113 immigrants arrived on the ship Anne, 
Over the next decade, Parliament funded the migration of 2,500 settlers, making Georgia the only government-funded colonial project. Oglethorpe's vision for Georgia followed the ideals of the Age of Reason, seeing it as a place for England's worthy poor to start anew. To encourage industry, he gave each male immigrant 50 acres of land, tools, and a year's worth of supplies. In Savannah, the Oglethorpe Plan provided for a utopia, an agrarian model of sustenance while sustaining egalitarian values holding all men as equal. Oglethorpe's vision called for alcohol and slavery to be banned. However, colonists who relocated from other colonies, especially South Carolina, disregarded these prohibitions. Despite its proprietor's early vision of a colony, guided by Enlightenment ideals and free of slavery, by the 1750s, Georgia was producing quantities of rice grown and harvested by the enslaved. Four point five wars for empire. Learning objectives. By the end of this section, you will be able to describe the wars for empire. Analyze the significance of these conflicts. Wars for empire composed a final link connecting the Atlantic sides of the British Empire. Great Britain fought four separate wars against Catholic France from the late 1600s to the mid 1700s. Another war, the War of Jenkins Ear pitted Britain against Spain. These conflicts for control of North America also helped colonists forge important alliances with native peoples, as different tribes aligned themselves with different European powers. Generations of Warfare Generations of British colonists grew up during a time when much of North America, especially the Northeast, engaged in war. Colonists knew war firsthand. In the 18th century, fighting was seasonal. Armies mobilized in the spring, fought in the summer, and retired to winter quarters in the fall. The British Army imposed harsh discipline on its soldiers, who were drawn from the poorer classes, to ensure they did not step out of line during engagements. If they did, their officers would kill them. On the battlefield, armies dressed in bright uniforms to advertise their bravery and lack of fear they stood in tight formation and exchanged volleys with the enemy. They often feared their officers more than the enemy. Most imperial conflicts had both American and European fronts, leaving us with two names for each war. For instance, King William's War, 1688-1697, is also known as the War of the League of Augsburg. In America, the bulk of the fighting in this conflict took place between New England and New France. The war proved inconclusive, with no clear victor. Queen Anne's War, 1702-1713, is also known as the War of Spanish Succession. England fought against both Spain and France over who would ascend the Spanish throne after the last of the Habsburg rulers died. In North America, Fighting took place in Florida, New England, and New France. In Canada, the French prevailed but lost Acadia and Newfoundland. However, the victory was again not decisive because the English failed to take Quebec, which would have given them control of Canada. This conflict is best remembered in the United States for the French and Native raid against Deerfield, Massachusetts in 1704. A small French force combined with a native group made up of Catholic Mohawks and Abenaki, Pockhamtucks, attacked the frontier outpost of Deerfield, killing scores and taking 112 prisoners. Among the captives was the seven-year-old daughter of Deerfield's minister John Williams, named Eunice. She was held by the Mohawks for years as her family tried to get her back and became assimilated into the tribe. To the horror of the Puritan leaders, when she grew up, Eunice married a Mohawk and refused to return to New England. In North America, possession of Georgia and trade with the interior was the focus of the War of Jenkins Ear, 1739-1742, a conflict between Britain and Spain over contested claims to the land occupied by the fledgling colony 
between South Carolina and Florida. The war got its name from an incident in 1731, in which a Spanish Coast Guard captain severed the ear of British Captain Robert Jenkins as punishment for raiding Spanish ships in Panama. Jenkins fueled the growing animosity between England and Spain by presenting his ear to Parliament and stirring up British public outrage. More than anything else, the War of Jenkins' Ear disrupted the Atlantic trade, a situation that hurt both Spain and Britain, and was a major reason the war came to a close in 1742. Georgia, founded six years earlier, remained British and a buffer against Spanish Florida. King George's War, 1744 to 1748, known in Europe as the War of Austrian Succession, 1740 to 1748, was fought in the northern colonies and New France. In 1745, the British took the massive French fortress at Louisbourg on Cape Breton Island, Nova Scotia. However, three years later, under the terms of the Treaty of aix la chapelle Britain relinquished control of the fortress to the French. Once again, war resulted in an incomplete victory for both Britain and France. The French and Indian War The final imperial war, the French and Indian War, 1754 to 1763, known as the Seven Years' War, 1756 to 1763, in Europe, proved to be the decisive contest between Britain and France in America. It began over rival claims along the frontier in present-day western Pennsylvania. Well-connected planters from Virginia faced stagnant tobacco prices and hoped expanding into these western lands would stabilize their wealth and status. Some of them established the Ohio Company of Virginia in 1748, and the British Crown granted the company half a million acres in 1749. However, the French also claimed the lands of the Ohio Company, and to protect the region they established Fort Duquesne, in 1754, where the Ohio, Monongahela, and Allegheny Rivers met. The war began in May 1754 because of these competing claims between Britain and France. 22-year-old Virginian George Washington, a surveyor whose family helped to found the Ohio Company, gave the command to fire on French soldiers near present-day Uniontown, Pennsylvania. This incident on the Pennsylvania frontier proved to be a decisive event that led to imperial war. For the next decade, fighting took place along the frontier of New France and British America from Virginia to Maine. The war also spread to Europe as France and Britain looked to gain supremacy in the Atlantic world. The British fared poorly in the first years of the war. In 1754, the French and their native allies forced Washington to surrender at Fort Necessity, a hastily built fort constructed after his attack on the French. In 1755, Britain dispatched General Edward Braddock to the colonies to take Fort Duquesne. The French, aided by the Potawatomis, Ottawas, Shawnees, and Delawares, ambushed the 1,500 British soldiers and Virginia militia who marched to the fort. The attack sent panic through the British force, and hundreds of British soldiers and militiamen died, including General Braddock. The campaign of 1755 proved to be a disaster for the British. In fact, the only British victory that year was the capture of Nova Scotia. In 1756 and 1757, Britain suffered further defeats with the fall of Fort Oswego and Fort William Henry. The war began to turn in favor of the British in 1758, due in large part to the efforts of William Pitt, a very popular member of Parliament. Pitt pledged huge sums of money and resources to defeating the hated Catholic French, and Great Britain spent part of the money on bounties paid to new young recruits in the colonies, helping invigorate the British forces. In 1758, the Iroquois, Delaware, and Shawnee signed the Treaty of Easton, aligning themselves with the British in return for some contested land around Pennsylvania and Virginia. 
1759, the British took Quebec and, in 1760, Montreal. The French Empire in North America had crumbled. The war continued until 1763, when the French signed the Treaty of Paris. This treaty signaled a dramatic reversal of fortune for France. Indeed, New France, which had been founded in the early 1600s, ceased to exist. The British Empire had now gained mastery over North America. The empire not only gained New France under the treaty, it also acquired French sugar islands in the West Indies, French trading posts in India, and French-held posts on the west coast of Africa. Great Britain's victory in the French and Indian War meant that it had become a truly global empire. British colonists joyously celebrated, singing the refrain of rule Britannia. Britannia, rule the waves. Britons never, never, never shall be slaves. In the American colonies, ties with Great Britain were closer than ever. Professional British soldiers had fought alongside Anglo-American militiamen, forging a greater sense of shared identity. With Great Britain's victory, colonial pride ran high as colonists celebrated their identity as British subjects. This last of the wars for empire, however, also sowed the seeds of trouble. The war led Great Britain deeply into debt, and in the 1760s and 1770s, efforts to deal with the debt through imperial reforms would have the unintended consequence of causing stress and strain that threatened to tear the empire apart. This has been U.S. History from OpenStax. OpenStax textbooks and this free audiobook are covered under a Creative Commons license. The full text is available at www.openstax.org. This project was made possible by CC Echo, the California Consortium for Equitable Change in Hispanic Serving Institutions, Open Education Resources. You can learn more about CC Echo by visiting the link in this episode's show notes. You can find this audiobook anywhere you listen to podcasts, including Spotify, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and more. Instructors can even download a course shell to embed these recordings in Canvas courses. Learn more by visiting www.openaudio.us. Did you find this audiobook helpful? If so, let us know by leaving a comment and sharing this recording with a colleague or a friend.